The super success of the IT services sector in India hit one aspect of the industry which was relatively underexploited and that was the product sector. Sure enough in the early days companies like Wipro did experiment with products for the Indian market and of course there was a significant success story in iFlex which truly created a world class product but sadly over many decades products were more created by large companies today with products as well as digital platforms for an array of service areas i think we can easily build a trillion dollar industry just in products and to discuss this we have invited three discussants who will actually share the conversation the first is sharad sharma who has been a product evangelist for many decades and a very good friend then meena ganesh who has been a colleague of mine from the early days and has herself moved from it services to building a very substantial ecosystem for innovators and finally one of our unicorn success stories nitin kamath of zeroda who has actually created waves already so let's start with meeting sharad well hello this is one of the most exciting episodes that we have in this entire series because we're going to talk about something which can drive the future of the it industry which is products and i'm delighted to have with me sharad sharma Sharad and I have known each other for decades and had multiple discussions many arguments on the value of IT products versus IT services so let's start with getting to know you Sharad what makes you such a passionate evangelist of IT products you know i'm an electrical engineer but along the way i got interested in unix the unix kernel particularly and this is way back in late 80s and unix was cooking in university labs and uh, you know and eventually in the 90s it went on to kind of displace all the proprietary operating systems that were there and then i kind of stuck with that area and i saw that there is usually a world behind the curtain and that world behind the curtain is uh, is kind of very powerful and uh, uh, and and so i kind of got hooked to that and uh, so i've been in various r&d setups you and i met when i was heading veritas uh, r&d and uh, and subsequently i've been part of yahoo i've done a startup which is part of cisco i've been in at&t bell labs for a number of years so uh, so i've been in this r&d kind of a world which is a little bit behind the scenes not the app world and so i tend to view uh, things here yeah, from that perspective so sharad i mean i know you since our, our arguments in the uh, days of nascom when you were part of the executive yes. council and i remember you were always a little frustrated and a, and somewhat eager that we must focus more on products and of yes. course you got the product conferences and the conclaves off to a great start so what's your view on the progress of products over the last 20 years or so ever since you started evangelizing it and where are we today are we satisfactory in your opinion no i think we're making progress uh, uh, you know but first to set the record state i think uh, the it services industry really brought about a roger banister effect right and i think that has been a very positive effect you know roger banister after 150 years broke the four mile barrier right and the year that he broke it in 19 uh, if i remember it was 1954 may 1954 that year alone suddenly inspired by his example more people were able to cross it. and by 57 1600 16 people had been able to do it now 1400 people have been able to do it right so the banister effect is that if somebody breaks the mold then others can follow right and i think the it services did that for large employee kind of organizations right so their tcs has lakhs of employees in forces and others and they are very well run organizations we have 15 20% market share in the global outsourcing uh, kind of an industry and you can see if in the last 25 30 years this has been repeated in many areas right you have you you've had a situation where indigo is emerged as a fairly large airline carrying 7% of the world's uh, you know passengers you have arvind eye care which does you know 6% of the world cataract surgeries right and successfully more than any other country for that matter right i mean in in some respects any big country other than us uh, all countries are smaller than uk more than uk for example uh, you know you have had uh, akshay patra doing 1.8 million meals you have jio carrying 15% of the mobile bandwidth of the world right all this has happened because 
the IT services industry showed that we could create large organizations in India. And I think India has learned how to create these large organizations. But behind this world, there is another reality. And the reality is that Microsoft makes more money than the top 20 IT services companies of the world put together. Right? The reality is that Pfizer makes more money than top 100 hospital chains of the US put together. The reality is that Cisco makes more money than the top five European mobile operators put together. And Boeing and Airbus make more money than all airlines of the world put together. Right? So the question is, there is a part of this reality where India has done very well. And I'm really pleased about that innings. But there is a part of this reality where India is not a player. We are not in aviation. We are in aviation as airline, but we are not in aviation as aircraft. We are not in telecom. We are in telecom as services, but we are not there as Huawei and Ericsson and in equipment. We are there in software services, but we are not there in software products. We are in pharma, you know, hospital care, you know, Narayan Vidyale, Arvind Eye Care, but we are not in the in the place where the profits are kept. So, so really the question and the angst that you hear from me is why can't India also have that innings? Right? We are bright people. You know, we, you know, Indians can be head of Google, but why can't we create a damn Google here in India, right? So that's, the, and if we don't, then my sense is we'll be like Thailand. Thailand and Korea and Thailand, Korea explicitly decided in 1974 that the structure of the economy that they'll focus on is going to be different than that of Thailand. And at that time, Thailand's per capita was more than Korea. Today, Korea is 5.6 times of Thailand and Thailand is a East Asian success story. And the moment you do this, you see this in all places. Today, vaccinations, right? Korea has four times the vaccination rate of Thailand. Israel, you know, again, a product success story has 100% coverage on its own. But you see, you know, 75% of the vaccines have been done in 10 countries. And there are 100 countries who are really services countries. Don't have a single dose of vaccination given to them. Because vaccines are with people who have actually done something there. And India is at least a player in vaccine because we created a rotavirus vaccine that, uh, thanks to Dr. Bhan back in time. And that set up the vaccine industry for us. And had that not happened, we would also be like Bangladesh and Pakistan begging for vaccines everywhere else in the world. So I have a vision for India that India is going to have, it had a very good innings in services, but it also ought to have an innings in products, right? And now your question is, are we getting there? And I think the Roger Bannister effect has happened. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. And, and therefore, in the next 15, 20 years, we'll see action as we go forward. But, the, but now we don't want to be Roger Bannister. We want to be Carl Lewis. We don't want to be Thailand. Sure. We want to be sure. Korea. So how do we exactly. become the Korea of the future in terms of products? Yeah, so I think the important part, and some of it, even before I come to software, I told you about you know, rotavirus. Rotavirus has led to COVID virus, right? Uh, uh, vaccination industry, in, in some sense, you know, back in your backyard, you have serum, uh, but you have Bharat Biotech and, and, and so on and so forth. But you also, we are doing well, let's say with LCA. You know, this is starting to look promising in some area. I think in software, the, the, the places where this is starting to look promising is Zoho. Now, you know, let's take Zoho as an example. Loho on a daily basis has 40 million of its 60 million users logging into Zoho, right? Now that's very substantial. That if you take all our IT services industry, the top five players and total up and say we have 4,000 or so unique big businesses, right? Which means that if everybody was served by a software that was made by an Infosys engineer, which means all 40 million potential employees of the IT services industry, that a small product company out of Chennai is doing every day. Now, that is not recognized, but this is a serious story. We don't recognize that today Tally, because of GST coming in, has more business customers, paying business customers, than Google Suite has or QuickBooks have. We don't appreciate this. right? Think of it. Google Suite, the, one of the most successful companies in the world, has about 6 million paying customers for Google Suites as small businesses. That's the number Tally has. Tally has more paying customers than QuickBooks has the world over, right? So I could go on and on. So there are these shifts that are taking place. 
and all of them are having happening because they are domestically focused and focused in the india segment they're not catering to 30 million indians you know the californian indians that you and i are but they're focusing to the middle india what you and i refer to as bharat right so there are these success stories this is like going back to you know the you remember when infosys uh, ipo took place it wasn't fully subscribed for heaven's sake now you can look back and say what were people thinking right isn't it so we are at that moment today that people don't yet realize the significance of what is happening in the product industry but you know the wheels are in motion and if we are just patient and we keep uh, moving forward we will see stuff happening and of course this is a much more complex industry right because you need to go after a bharat market which, which has never been served before you know nobody has served this before you have to rely on public goods right and public infrastructure that had no, had that had literally to be created you had to create a payment system for india right and uh, and you had to create kyc see the gap that has emerged between between the performance of indian startups in india and uh, indian startups versus indonesian startups both have had the same covid impact but the indian startups have galloped in almost every area the digitization has gone deeper why has it gone deeper because kyc is possible in india which is not possible in indonesia it is possible for people to pay money using upi which is not possible to do in indonesia so the indian startup experience is that the indian startups have benefited because of deepening of digitization in the covid era now this is not a story of indonesia which is one of the comparable countries that we used to have especially in the startup scene so the digital infrastructure has made a difference right and and this is powering this uh, and the third is we need a new type of a entrepreneur we call them athletic gavaskars so if you want i'll tell you a little bit about this no but let, let me you mentioned uh, uh, zoho of course that is a very very i would say say the same poster child of products as we have in infosys and right. others in services but if you look at the dna of the entrepreneur but what is that dna of the entrepreneur i mean is he is he going to be is he or she going to be a very different person from what has yes. built the it services industry i think so uh, and and you know and this is not unusual you know the 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 person who runs cisco is very different from the person who runs verizon you know verizon has lots of employees it's an operational business you know cisco has basically you know lots of engineers right and and they have to acquire startups you know it's a very different dna and and we must recognize that different businesses need different business dna right i mean if you're creating a mass luxury brand you need a different kind of a entrepreneur than what if you were creating an infosys and and that difference uh, you know is beginning and 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 this is the shift that happens in the tech industry even within the industry so i think we need a different type of an uh, 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 kind of a entrepreneur we call them athletic gavaskars right because they it's a very demanding field i'll tell you why is it demand so let me make it even more tangible because we are doing a history thing sanjeev bikchandani who is for the right reasons in the news by the time he faced competition in nokri nokri had already done its ipo it could therefore fend off monster and jobs ahead because it was already a big ipo company by the time deep kalra had to face competition he was one year away from his ipo it was in the a year before his ipo that expedia made a big move in india right by the time phone pay faced google pay and has beaten it neck to neck it was in its very first year of existence so now how do you take on a goliath in your first year versus in your 10th year when you are an established business right it needs a different kind of an entrepreneur and why is this important because if our it services industry does very well it will have 30% market share it will have 40% market share if tcs does very well it will have 20% market share it's impossible for it to have 70% market share but google has 80% market share in what it does cisco has has 80% or 70% of the router market right pfizer is aiming publicly announced that they are aiming for 70% of the mrna vaccine market right you can go on and on in the product it is a winner take all so so it is a very very different environment that you operate in 
So therefore, the kind of entrepreneur that you need is obviously very different. And what had happened is that we are only now beginning to nurture those entrepreneurs and they are beginning to rise up to the surface. And we have to give ourselves a permission to let them be different from the stalwarts that we have had in the past. That takes nothing away from their success. But we need both, you know, to be a viable and successful India. You know, we need many types of success stories. And this success story is also very important for it. So, so last question to you, Sharad. Suppose we do find the Hardik Pandyas rather than the Rahul Dravids. We do create a great ecosystem for them. Today, if you look at the industry, $200 billion, probably less than 10% is real products and platforms. So do you really think that we can envisage a future when this industry grows to $500 billion and maybe $200 billion out of that comes from products? Is it possible in this country? You know, the product companies that we are talking about are all trillion-dollar market cap. Yeah? Two of them are the GDP of the country. Why can't we have a successful pharma company or a vaccine company out of India? You know, what could it have taken for us to have an mRNA vaccine out of India? The gap has narrowed substantially. You go back 10 years, it would have been an impossible proposition. Today, it is a possible proposition. And I'm submitting to you that 10 years later, it may become a likely proposition. Why? Because we have a market that is very significant. Even today, you know, compared to Intuit, one of the successful companies, QuickBooks, we have more customers for software products here in India. These are not global players, these are domestic players. Now, of course, what happens is that many of these new age companies, they don't make profits in the beginning. They make profits in the tail end of the process. So I think we must learn that can we create two types of companies? Can we create an Amazon retail, which will employ millions of employees, but will make no or marginal profits? And then we'll have Amazon Web Services, which will have a handful of employees, but will make more than 50% of the profit that the whole enterprise is making, Amazon is making. So we will be, as a country, need value-generating companies, which are product companies. We need employment-generating companies. It's not one or the other. A robust India is going to be one which will have both. And there are only two other countries that have both. There is US and there is China. You can have a Israel which has value creating companies, but not they don't need the employment. Or you can have Thailand and Vietnam, which have lots of employment generating companies, but don't have any on the on the profitability side. And so, but I hope India is both because then it has the potential to be a Korea or a China rather than just be a Thailand. And I think that's going to happen. And you're speaking with Nitin later. And I think Nitin is that athletic Gavaskar that we're talking about. See, in this difficult period of COVID, he is by thoughtfulness, uh, he has more than doubled his customer base by leveraging this public infrastructure in a very, very sensible fashion. Again, like Zoho, he's done it by bootstrapping it. Because we have this new narrative that has come in that unless you take, you know, $7 billion to build Flipkart, you can't build a $20 billion value. No, that's not true, right? And, and so you can build a lot of value. Zoho has shown it. Uh, you know, uh, Zerodha is showing it that very often a product game is a long term game. It is a 20 year game. It doesn't break even very quickly. And but if you stay the course, you can actually create value as you go. Time for us now to move from the general discussion on products to specific entrepreneurs. Our first guest is Meena Ganesh. Meena started off her career in consulting and then has moved through a series of very, very successful entrepreneurship ventures. And today, of course, is the CEO of the very well-known company, Pochia. Meena herself is a passionate entrepreneur, prefers to build companies rather than just invest in them, and clearly is a role model for many people who are looking at being entrepreneurs in this industry. Hi, let's meet our first entrepreneur, Meena Ganesh. I met Meena for the first time when I joined NIIT in Delhi and I was heading corporate consultancy and training and she was our consulting head for the Delhi region. I'd just come in from the Indian Institute of Management. But very soon, I think the corporate role was not big enough for her and she started moving into the startup ecosystem. Has done some amazing work, both in terms of building an entrepreneurial ecosystem called Growth Story with her husband and also, of course, as a CEO of one of India's most successful healthcare startups, which is Potia. So, Meena, 
tell us a little bit about yourself what bit you as an entrepreneurial bug and what got you into this journey uh, i started my uh, career as an entrepreneur about 21 years back and um, over the last two decades have uh, built different com- companies in various uh, sectors starting from the bpo sector in uh, 2000 that was my first company customer asset uh, thereafter um, i was a co-founder of tutor vista which was an education space primarily focusing on online tutoring for the global markets but in india the model was completely different it was about digital health digital uh, education in schools uh, post school tutoring and also uh, later i set up a number of schools after that uh, in 2013 uh, um, we i started uh, potia medical as a founder and an entrepreneur but also from 2011 we started to do a number of um, uh startups as a platform so ganesh and i which is my husband is also called ganesh by the way and he and i started um a number of uh, nearly 12 startups we have as a part of our uh, uh platform called growth story and uh, of course the best known of that is uh, big basket and then there is uh, blue stone and uh, home lane and uh, verloop and a uh, number of others so it's been a very interesting uh, journey to see how the Uh, over the last two decades the startup ecosystem has changed so drastically but mina tell us one thing you clearly had a very successful corporate career and still chose to become an entrepreneur so i really want to understand the motivation for you to do that because as you are well aware i mean mr narendra modi our prime minister has been exhorting people to get into startups and it has become a fashion almost if you will and some people are successful some people are not but what motivated you early on to choose an entrepreneurial career yeah so um uh, after nit ganesh where you and i worked together i was with price water house and then uh, i had joined microsoft and uh, from 95 to 2000 i was there and uh, one of my roles um, uh, that um, i was uh, playing towards the end of my career in microsoft was working with a lot of software developers and convincing them to use the microsoft back office platform so i came in contact with a large number of uh, small and medium uh, entrepreneurs um, i got to understand what it takes for them to build what are the challenges that they face so while i was watching what uh, ganesh uh, my husband was doing with the uh, itnt but i also got another view of what was happening in the uh, in the startup software industry so i started to feel that this was something that was of uh, interest to me i wanted to get into uh, being in the startup space but i was also sure that i didn't want to do anything in the software industry so i looked at something which was different and um, that's where the whole idea of uh, uh, outsourced customer service started to come in my mind as well as there was a, starting to be a little buzz around that and that's the time mckinsey and uh, nascom had put out a study on the next big wave of um, outsourcing would be in the bpo space uh, it wasn't called bpo then but nevertheless uh, so i started to look at that area and that is how i started my first company customer asset uh, when we started customer asset the uh, thesis behind that is that uh, we would work with um, internet companies and provide them back end support um, through email and through chat and those kind of uh, media so it was not supposed to be a call center so the kind of plans that we had in terms of fundraise and the uh, uh, and the the kind of infrastructure required was of a different uh, size and scale altogether but very soon we realized that that entire industry was um, going through a huge bust and shifted from being um, internet uh, support company to a call center company which meant that the entire uh expectation of what we need to do the people the 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 infrastructure the the in investments that are required all that change nevertheless we plowed along and we brought we were able to raise further uh, investments and we we did pretty well but then again we got hit by 911 so uh, in the year 2001 uh, our entire business uh, literally came to a standstill but in spite of that um, after a few months we managed to uh, come back into um, you know the, uh, we were we, we didn't have any money at all we were completely out of uh, money and we didn't pay any salaries for many months three months or four months but after that things came back and we raised around and we were coasting along really well 
and uh, we grew pretty well. We got to about 1,500 people. Um, but what it was very clear is that there was some kind of alignment that was happening. You may have noticed that Spectrum Mind got acquired by Wipro, Daksh got acquired by IBM, uh, Infosys set up Progeon. So it sort of seemed to indicate that uh, this BPO as such, uh, as a part of a larger entity, which had a certain other objectives also, might be a better outcome or might be a better uh, way forward for that. So that's how the ICICI one source uh, um, uh, opportunity came to us. So we decided it made sense for us to uh, make that, uh, do a strategic um, uh, acquisition by ICICI one source and sold the company to them, which then uh, from using that as the foundation, the company has become pretty big. It's now called first source. It's listed and it's uh, probably third or fourth largest in the country. That's excellent, Meena. And you must be doubly proud that your little startup is doing so well, albeit under new management. But then what made you move into the next big venture, a completely different space and still a very successful enterprise that you're running? What was the background and what happened? Yeah, yeah. So Ganesh, actually, uh, before that, I start, before we started Tutor Vista, I actually started to work with Tesco and I set up their entire uh, IT and back office center as the, CEO, as the founding CEO of that. Um, in the meantime, Ganesh and a um, couple of other of our friends, we all started to think about what are some of the other interesting areas. And that's where the whole concept of um, online tutoring for the uh, global market using Indian teachers came into being. And that's, that was Tutor Vista. Of course, we were poo pooed quite extensively by people saying, firstly, you're trying to create a, a B2C brand in the US from India. Nobody had done that. It was all, um, most of the companies till then were B2B companies that um, came from India. So it was uh, probably one of the early B2C um, uh, offerings that we were coming up from here uh, was one. Secondly, you're trying to teach uh, American children, uh, American students, English and math using Indian teachers. So that was also something which was... Uh, uh, quite uh, counterintuitive to most people. So it took us a while, but um, uh, we um, uh, started the uh, product. We, um, we did some uh, MVP and once things started to look like it was, um, it was really meaningful, then we raised money and uh, then the rest is history. So here's the last question for you, Meena. Having been there, done that, both in the very nascent industry of business process outsourcing, and now, of course, in the very, very heated entrepreneurial space, which is healthcare, what would be your advice to new entrepreneurs with stars in their eyes who get motivated either for the wrong reasons, got fired from a previous job, or for the right reasons, very excited about entrepreneurship? What areas should they be looking at? What are the future sunrise areas that you can point them towards? So uh, I want to answer this question actually in two parts. One is I'll give you what I think that a direct answer to your question, but I feel that there's yet another angle to whatever is uh, changing and whatever is happening. As far as uh, the answer that you um, gave, I believe that um, uh, in the, there are the blockchain um, and uh, NFT kind of technologies look very, very interesting. Um, uh, of course, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning based uh, healthcare solutions look very interesting to me. And I see some, early startups in that. Um, FinTech, the amount of change that it is undergoing is uh, phenomenal. And I'm sure there will be uh, interesting things to come in there. I'm not a big expert in that, uh, though I'm, I've recently joined a board of a bank, but uh, I don't have that much of FinTech knowledge other than what I'm seeing. But what I want to actually uh, speak about is where are the opportunities that have got created for entrepreneurship because of all that has happened. See, I believe that in the last 10 years or so, some really amazing infrastructure has got built, whether it is the, the flip cards of the world or Amazon's coming in here or the FinTech solutions that have got created. What it has done is that it has put in place a certain level of infrastructure. What is it? A way to reach customers for the people across the country to access your products and services without you having to set up large B2C sales infrastructure, you can ride on various um, uh, e-commerce platforms that are there. You can use the delivery engines that have got created by the uh, deliveries of the world and many others. You can use the, the sachetization of payment that has got created. 
So all of these, I believe, are massive infrastructures that have got created in this country, which did not exist. So when Flipkart started, they had to actually think about COD and uh, reverse logistics. None of that was there. They had to do all of that themselves. But today, everything is there. What does that mean to uh, the possibility or what are the what does it mean to uh, entrepreneurship in this country? I believe that there is a democratization of entrepreneurship that this can drive. People, uh, big or small, uh, with, uh, uh, with who have maybe very, very uh, specific products and services that they create, niche solutions that they have put in place, they can actually now ride on top of these various infrastructure, including EdTech. When you, as you can be a teacher in a small uh, village, you have very interesting capability to solve problems of a certain kind. You can uh, log on to one of these various EdTech platforms. You can be one of their tutors. You can take 10 rupees per problem solved without having to go through the complexities of our fintech of our financial systems because of fintech so what this is what this means i think is that uh, the people in uh, tier 2 tier 3 smaller towns smaller villages can actually aspire to become entrepreneurs because they have access to markets they have access to financial systems uh, they have access to consumers without having to spend a huge amount of money or uh, be funded by a very large pocket. So I think this can be a, a complete transformation to where entrepreneurship can actually reach in this country. Let's now move to a conversation with another extremely successful and dynamic entrepreneur. Somebody who started off like so many people in this industry, just another call center executive and is today building a truly successful unicorn, Zeroda. Nitin Kamat is a story that many of us will want to emulate and let's hear it from the man himself. So here we are again and this time we are bringing you a very different kind of entrepreneur. Somebody who was not part of the glorious history of IT services or BPO or engineering etc. But who has, still being very young, actually moved from trading to call center work to actually being a franchisee of a broker and now has built a company which is not only a unicorn in terms of a billion dollar assist valuation, but more important is a very profitable unicorn. So in these days when people think that profits are out of fashion, here's a wonderful story which will kind of give you, to my mind, a look into the future of this industry. If you are proud of what we have built, I think the future can be a much better place. So Nitin, welcome to our show. And maybe you could just start by introducing yourself and giving our viewers a sense of who is Nitin Kamal. Thanks, uh, Ganesh. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the, uh, I know I started Zeroda, which is today the largest uh, brokerage in India. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean, for those who don't know what's a stock brokerage, you know, we compete with the likes of ICSA Direct, HDFC Securities. And uh, so we started in 2010. Uh, I uh, I went to an engineering college, you know, so if, if I can put it lightly. Uh, and uh, around the time I was completing my engineering, I also, I started trading very early at around 16, 17. Around the time I was finishing my engineering, I also blew up my trading account. Um, so I went and uh, worked in a call center for three, four years until 2005. Uh, and, uh, you know, trying to put back my trading capital. Uh, and call center kind of allowed me to work nights, straight days. Um, in 2006, I met this gentleman who saw my performance for that period and said, dude, can you do this for me as well? So I quit my job and uh, I became a franchisee of a larger brokerage firm. Um, in 2008, uh, the num number of customers slowly grew. My younger brother joined me in 2008. Uh, I mean, he was uh, 2007. He was, you know, you probably can say better trader than I was. Uh, you know, evolution of sorts. He's seven years younger to me. Uh, so in 2008, we made some money when the markets fell. And uh, and I was very active uh, person online. So through the time uh, I traded uh, in my life, I was very active. I, I used to run the largest Yahoo Messenger group for stock trading, the largest Orkut communities, the largest Facebook community. So I always had this key of trying to share as much knowledge as possible around markets. Uh, a lot of it in my pseudo name. Uh, so, uh, you know, in 2009, uh, you know, after this whole financial crisis, uh, we had uh, made some money in the market fall. 
So we said, you know what, we need to take a broking license and try to build a brokerage firm that active traders didn't have in India, right? Because a lot of uh, traders used to pay very high brokerage charges. Uh, and for all these features that you never use as a trader, like for example, some of the big brokers had large offices in Bombay, paying incredible amounts of salaries to their relationship managers or their research reports, which very active traders never cared for. And so, uh, so this business started for all very active day traders and uh, futures and options traders. Uh, but around 2013, 14, we realized that that market is a very shallow kind of a market. You know, you can't really build a large business if you're focusing just on an active trading community. Thankfully, uh, Kailash, who heads our tech, joined us around that time. So he is really the brain behind, uh, you know, we, we call ourselves as FinKek because we call him K. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so around him, the product journey started around 2013. Uh, 2015 is when we put out our first in-house product called Kite, uh, very minimalistic and very different to traditional trading platforms. Uh, while it was very simple to look at, it also had all the features that very active traders required. So that was really the first time the virality started kicking in once we had our own in-house product because the first four or five years was all on top of vendor products. Um, so 2016, uh, uh, one of the things that we did well was when we were building Kite, we first built out this thing called as Kite Connect APIs, uh, on which Kite, the web and mobile platform was built. Uh, so in 2016, we said, you know, to grow the capital market ecosystem in this country, we need unique experiences, you know, just another buy sell trading platform is not enough. So we opened up these APIs and we invited startups to come build on top of us. You know, think of it as Android and Play Store, right? So today there are around 14, 15 startups who, who come built very niche trading platforms on top of us. The reason startups came to us is because firstly, there's a lot of red tape when it comes to regulations, compliance, being a stockbroker. So we kind of took away all that headache from them. Uh, also more importantly, in the business of money, credibility takes a long time, right? As in you don't trust your bank, you know, very quickly just because someone's giving you more interest rates. Right. So for these startups, we almost we showcase their products as their, our own product. So uh, customers trusted us, so the interns started uh, trusted the startups. So the, they could validate the products very quickly. Uh, so this initiative we call Rain Matter uh, has done extremely well. Um, and uh, and then yeah, you know demonetization happened. Probably one of the tipping points uh, in our business because uh, onboarding a customer was a forty-page document until two thousand sixteen. And, and thanks to Demon, people started, you know, this Aadhaar became popular because of Aadhaar, KYC, eSign became popular. So uh, account opening process, which is to take like 14, 15 days, took like half an hour. And uh, so we were at around 100,000 customers in 2016. Uh, today we are at 5 million customers. Uh, so that, that trajectory, you know, kind of just took off from the time we could onboard customers online. Uh, and last year, something very strange happened, you know, when, you know, when the whole world was locked down. Uh, people suddenly took fancy for stock markets around the world, you know, so maybe it is uh, lower interest rates. Uh, maybe it is also because people had more time to think about their finances and also because, uh, 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 you know, people didn't spend as much money. So they had a lot more savings to deploy. So, so I think all these three combined together, uh, business grew really fast. So we are at 2 million customers last and we are at 5 million now. So, you know, so we've kind of doubled our business uh, in the last one year. So yeah, that's, uh, that's our journey in a gist, you know, so. What's an amazing, that's an amazing story. And, uh, but tell me, I mean, you said 5 million customers. What, what is the market size? I mean, if you look at I mean, really being the, I mean, you're already one of the biggest in India, but what is the potential to grow from here for you? Yeah, so uh, it, it is a very shallow market, right? So, um, I think even after all the increased activity, uh, last year probably had one and a half crore Indians who invested in the markets directly, you know, in stocks. Um, unique Indians. Uh, if you include mutual funds, maybe two crores in all, right? Now, two crores seems very little for a, you know, <laughs> 130 crore population. But in reality, I think our audience are people who at least file income tax returns. So I'm, I'm guessing that number is around six, seven crores. So the potential is to take this two crore kind of market to maybe six, seven crores. And also, I think we're seeing this behavior of a lot of these millennials, uh, you know, trying to, you know, well, I think today, the, today's millennial, millennial is a lot more curious, a lot more okay to taking risk in terms of their savings and investments. So I'm guessing 
uh, you know, total audience, you know, if you were to consider those millennials who probably are not filing their income tax returns today, is probably around 10 crores. So uh, there is there is an opportunity to increase this markets four five folds. The big issue with our markets though is that we are a high beta company, you know, so. Uh, your new client addition is completely dependent on how the underlying markets behave. Uh, so if the indices are doing well, so there's a lot of interest in opening accounts. But if markets are not doing well, you know, the interest drops off a cliff. So essentially what you're saying, Nitin, is that uh, people like me are being foolish, giving our money to private banks and stuff like that. We should <laughs> just give you a chunk of money and you'll do much better for them. <laughs> no, I mean, not really. I mean, see, the thing is, we uh, as a business, uh, until now, haven't really uh, done any management. So so we are just a platform. So people come and buy and sell uh, at Zeroda. So we uh, run some of the, one of the largest education initiatives in the world. Uh, so it's called Varsity. So on capital markets. Uh, so it's maybe the third, fourth largest in the world in terms of, you know, it's completely MOOC, free of cost, very active, very interactive. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, folks come and learn from that. Uh, we also run uh, the largest direct mutual fund platform in the country. So if you want to buy mutual funds without paying any commissions, uh, so we run this platform called Coin, which is the largest platform in the country. Uh, but we haven't yet solved for the advisory problem. And that's really the, uh, you know, one of the big opportunities that lie in the country. Because historically, uh, in India, financial products have been sold by uh, people who made commissions from manufacturer. So right. the incentives weren't aligned, maybe right. right. So now SEBI has put in this enablers of this thing called as a RIA or a, a investment advisor. Uh, investment advisor who can who has to collect fees from the customer as a advisory fees right so the the you know i think there is much lesser conflict of interest because an advisor can collect fees only if he is able to kind of show that he deserves the fees uh, which means um, you know as and when this advisory ecosystem grows i think professional advisors will end up turning customers also professional over time. I mean, that's that's the hope. And, and that's where I think the real opportunity lies in this country as well. But do you, you, do you see yourself morphing into a, a trusted advisor kind of company? So the thing is, we, uh, we are trying to today leverage uh, tech in a way to not really advise, but get people to you know, avoid making trading mistakes, right? So, so we built this platform called Nudge, which is like a layer on top of Kite, our web and mobile platform. So, so the thing is, uh, no, I've traded through my life and I think there are four or five very fundamental rules to follow when trading, uh, to just improve your odds of winning significantly, right? Which is things like don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? As in diversify or uh, don't, you know, be aware of this disposition bias, which is, you know, when you, if you have one stock, which is making money, one, which is losing money, instinctively, a lot of people like to sell what is making money and, you know, buy more of what is losing money, which is, probably the worst strategy, right? So, so we kind of know that some of these behaviors, maybe we can nudge people away from it on the trading platform itself. So currently the way we are looking at it is, is to provide people all these tools and utilities and also build these uh, behavioral kind of nudges to get people to do the right things. The actual picking up a stock and telling people what to buy or sell is a very complex problem because that, that depends on a person to person. And personally, I think it's very tough to do it digitally, right? Because, uh, you know, like a lot of people internationally have tried it with platforms like Wealthfront, Betterment, et cetera, but they haven't still been able to crack it, right? You know, for me to know what is your risk appetite, I, I don't think I can really do it by asking four or five questions. Uh, I think, you know, it requires a closer conversation. Uh, so so I, think, I think it's going to be a combination of physical plus digital kind of a solution that will eventually play out. So we still don't have an answer, but, uh, but we are hoping that we can find a startup whom we can back, you know, who's kind of uh, doing this. But that said, we have applied for an asset management license. So we should have our own mutual fund in the next uh, one year where uh, the plan is to build uh, you know, products which are, you know, which are kind of solving for problems versus having another mutual fund, which is hybrid fund or long-term fund or short-term fund or mid, right? more like, you know, say a Vanguard retirement fund, right? So where people don't really have to worry about what they're picking. You know, most people today are picking up for a certain reason, right? I mean, if I'm saving, I'm either saving for a retirement or to buy something material or for, you know, saving up to buy a house and stuff, right? So can you kind of build those products uh, where people know, I mean, they don't, you know, you don't, you don't end up confusing them with all these, 
uh, lingos that are used in the financial world. In this. Well, that's very good. Uh, tell, tell me, I've always been curious about where you got the name of the company. What <laughs> right. does it stand for? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's Zeroda is actually zero and Roda. Uh, Roda is uh, barriers in Sanskrit, like, you know, road or like, you know, so like that. So it's like okay. saying zero barriers. Uh, so when we were trying to come up with the name of a business, you know, we didn't want to come across like a company that will help you suddenly make money faster or, or uh, because most people in this business of money, right, they, they usually somehow you know, want to seem like somewhere you can grow really fast or you can make money faster. We were trying to you know, come across with a name that, that's true to what we are trying to do, which is to remove the barriers. Uh, while, yeah, it's, it's a little tongue twister of sorts. You know, so, but uh, it's, it's kind of worked well till now. You know. Oh, that's interesting. That's like my name, Ganesh, remover of obstacles. <laughs> that's what you guys say. <laughs> that's right. interesting. You also mentioned a very interesting thing, Nitin, about this whole ecosystem you're building for other startups to come in and through APIs, literally like bolt onto your platform. Now, I've been advocating in the industry for the last 20 years that large companies must provide what we call, you know, innovation ecosystems where small, you know, they can take companies to market. And honestly, it's been very disappointing in terms of startups working with large companies. So how do you guys do it? I mean, are you are you this generous entrepreneur who wants everybody to make money, or what's what's the deal? Here? Yeah, no, I think I think uh, so the thing is, uh, uh, what, I mean, I don't know if it's the right way to put it, but we haven't raised any capital, right? And and this whole revenue growth has never been our chase, right? Our chase has always been how do you offer because if, you know every customer i look at it as you know it's me right as a customer and and what's the best product we can offer and yeah so that's what drives us as a business you know i mean even if you look at our core team uh, none of us has, have left the you know it's 10 years and the first 100 almost all of us are still around right and uh, uh, and everything we do is open source right as in uh, like if for example, uh, Kailash who at Satek, you know, he built this, this email, email sending utility, uh, which, because we send out like four or five million emails on a, on a daily basis, right? And all this MailChimp, et cetera, was expensive. So we built something for ourselves. And the first thing we did was go open source it. We said, you know what, others also need to be able to access something like this, right? So it's, it's just that kind of an ideology. Uh, you know, the, the, what we are looking at right now is to say, we need to grow the capital market ecosystem. And we can't do this alone and we have to do this together. And, you know, in the business of money for startups to build credibility is incredibly tough, right? As in, you know, today startups have access to money, but money doesn't, you know, capital doesn't help you build credibility fast, right? As in, um, so I think the biggest value we bring to that relationship is actually we vouch for these startups, right? More than giving them APIs or giving them access to, uh, you know, capital. The more important thing is, we, we showcase these you know, startups to our customers saying, you know what, this, this is a product that we trust. We are a stakeholder in this business. Uh, why don't you give this a shot? So products can, you know, these companies can quickly go from an idea to building a product to validating a product very quickly. Otherwise, in business of money, you know, by the time you, you are able to get a critical audience to trust you with their money, it will take you a really, really long time. And most people today don't have the time to wait it out, right? And uh, so yeah, so what what drives us here is essentially, uh, you know, this this you know this this true north for all of us is to grow the ecosystem because we all believe that uh, for country to go, you know, we need to the financialization has to happen, right? As in, you need more people to be moving their money from real estate, gold, etc., to financial assets, and we know that we can somehow play a part in this, and we also know that because we've been lucky to get here without raising external capital, we are probably best positioned to think like this, right? Because it becomes very tough for someone, you know, who has investors to answer to, to say, you know, how, why, how would you let someone else come build business on top of your customer base, right? As in, those are very tough questions to answer. And we realize that we are in a sweet spot, so we should uh, do this, you know. But Nitin, I mean, if you're saying you raise no capital whatsoever, it's entirely bootstrapped. How did you get your first X number of customers? I mean, was it through digital marketing? How do you even get, and that too, you have a very funny name, if I may say so. <laughs> How do you get a zero that to taken yeah. seriously by your first set of customers? Yeah. 
No, it's it's taken us ten years. Uh, so this this hasn't really happened uh, overnight. But like you said, right? I think uh, before Zeroda started in uh, 2010, I was actively trading for 10, 12 years. So I had really large. I had already built up a large community around folks who traded, etc. The first two three years was all built through that. You know, it was essentially going after those networks and you know putting a word. Uh, and and uh, and a lot of these, you know. Uh, networks were built using pseudo names, so a lot of people didn't know that it's Nitin, the guy who runs mm-hmm. Zeroda. So it, it it helped in kind of putting a word up there. Um, and uh, until date, we have spent zero rupees on advertisement, right? So we haven't done any marketing or advertising, uh, not a single good Google AdWord campaign till date. So uh, so yeah, so everything essentially is is grown word of mouth, and uh, and it's grown on the back of the products. Right, the first few years it was because you know we were pricing, you know, because we were much better pricing uh, as compared to a competition. So very active traders, day traders, futures and options traders, it made a large difference. But once you know we had other people drop their pricing to ours, it's it's generally been uh, gen- better products, you know, better initiatives, be the education initiatives. All of all of this together is what uh, has given us uh, the customer base. Given, given the fact they're such a tech savvy company. And as you said, uh, your your CTO obviously doing great work. So does that mean that your main target audience is the tech savvy millennials, or is it across the board? No, no, it's across the board. No, so across so board. the thing is, uh, the the biggest challenge in in, in our business is that uh, we are catering. Our revenue comes from very active day traders, right? And these very active day traders, which is an options traders, they care for all the bells and whistles. You know, they're almost like these car racing enthusiasts. Who need every button to you know to be on their dashboard, right? But on the other side, uh, the meat of the audience in terms of the number of people that we cater to is actually first-time investors, right? Uh, who need simplicity as well, right? So I think I think the the right product fit here is keeping this very simple while also being you know being able to cater to the very active trading community. I think that's what we've done a decent job with, and one of the one of the ways we have done it is by not building this super app of sorts. Uh, so we, we actually have taken the Google-like approach, right? You know, like uh, we have Coin for direct mutual funds, uh, Kite for trading or you know, Console for, you know, reporting. So, so by keeping these uh, separate products, it's helped us keep like, you know, each product very simple, clutter-free of sorts. Yeah, so that's, that's essentially what has worked well for us. Nathan, so do you see competition emerging with a very similar model who can price you down or something like that? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I think uh, you know, competition is is coming from all uh, all sides now. Uh, I think the more we've spoken about our profitability, our revenues, I think we are essentially creating more competition for ourselves. Uh, I think, especially the last year, uh, 2020, 2021, the interest for uh, fintech and within fintech, uh, this whole savings, investing, wealth has just blown off the roof. Robinhood. Uh, is valued at sixty billion dollars. You know, who's a very similar kind of a business like ours. So that valuation number is kind of, uh, I think, getting a lot of those foreign investors to uh, bankroll a lot of Indian companies to do this. Um, so yeah, so uh, I think I think uh, uh, stock broking the trading platform is a very complex product, right? Because um, we have to talk to exchanges, depositories, uh, KRAs. I mean, we have to talk to all these different people and keep it all instant, keep it all fast, keep it all live, right? It's not, you know, in banking, you know, you could be a little slow and no one cares, right? As in, 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 in our business, you cannot be down. You, can, you have to be, you know, you have to be able to talk to all of these guys, offer all these charting, offer all these reports, do all of this. So this is a, this is a complex piece of technology, right? And, uh, and we are a few years ahead of a competition in terms of a product because we started much early. So I think whoever uh, is going to offer the better product is going to win this eventually. And, uh, uh, and I think the organizational structure that we have where uh, none of us are chasing this revenue or growth versus, you know, we are always constantly getting up every day and saying, you know, how do we make our product better uh, versus having to worry, what do I have to sell to the next investor and all of that. You know, so I think it, it just, you know, it's kind of a moat for us. Um, and uh, and that's one of the reasons why even in such good times, we have no plans to raise any capital because, you know, I, I don't know, you know, three or four years from back and you know, after this, I look back and say, you know what, 
damn 2021 was was when we should have raised money because it was a, it's right now it's a stupid time for a stock broker you know like a tech first stock broking business to go raise money you know so uh, we are we are saying no to it because we we feel that we can we potentially would be letting go of our moat if we did go out and raise money you know so that's amazing confidence <laughs> which brings me to the last part nitin which is i mean as you, as we both know there's been this huge hype around startups over the last at least 4 5 years and of course people have been investing earlier as well but the reality is too many people have jumped in either without a business plan or without a business model or without a team or any kind of capital raising window so i mean if you were to look at the market in general i mean all the fintechs and the edtechs who are not the big ones but who are there what would you recommend i mean if you, if you were just to give a general advice to a new startup or a young man who has worked for two years and like you wants to do a big startup any 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 quick thoughts on what should definitely be avoided and what they could look for yeah no no i think i think you know like they say right you need to sharpen the axe before you go chopping wood right as in uh, i think one of the reasons why our business worked was because i had put 10 12 years before zeroda started right it was not like a idea that came in the coffee shop and suddenly you know we went raise money and uh, and, uh, and took it to whatever fruition types you know it it is uh, i think i think that's what's missing today because a lot of people with no core competencies are trying to go build businesses it's almost like getting up one day and saying i'll run the olympics 400 meters right as in i mean uh, it it is a stupid time for an entrepreneur to go out and raise money right if you have the credentials i think it's stupid but but just raising money doesn't mean building a successful business and i was just i was just looking at you know like a report today that had exactly the same thing that you know just being able to raise capital doesn't you know has no relation to how successful the business can be right so uh, so a lot of people today i think you know maybe the media has got to blame for it as well right and success is associated with how much money you're raising uh, irrespective of what the business underlying business is doing uh, so i think uh, i think the i mean I mean we, we are in a bubble i don't know how big this gets right but you know but whenever this uh, this burst i think people will realize that uh, you know business is not equal to just raising capital right as in uh, uh, so yeah so my advice generally would be to first build core competencies understand the problem you're trying to solve maybe go work in an industry which is solving for that problem right and then get up and you know after a few years and say you know what are you still passionate about this cause right because um uh i mean of course you know once in a while someone's going to get lucky with this coffee shop idea but the odds of that happening is is very 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 less right and i think uh, the higher odds of uh, you know business working well is is when someone's building a business in something where his core competency lies right and uh, yeah so so that's essentially the advice for anyone looking to start off what, what do you think about this new fashionable word called pivoting that every six months you have to really pivot your model you haven't done any pivot so you very clear about what you want to do and you've done it so what's your thought on that no i mean it's it's good to to be able to adapt right but uh, but i don't i don't think a lot of people today who are pivoting are really adapting i mean they're just you know trying to extend their runway uh, you know because i think in this business of building uh, tra- you know actually very trading and building business i think is very similar you know it, it's all about how you are in control of the ego right a lot of times you know traders and businessmen let their ego control them which is you know throw you know when you start throwing good money at bad money right as in when you want to make a wrong right by throwing money at it you know so uh uh i think i think a lot of these pivots are that right which is uh because a lot of people today who are building businesses are very successful people through through their academic right i mean they've done iits i am i mean to the extent that i think a lot of people a lot of them have been told that their shit doesn't stink through their lives right doesn't because they educationally they've done so well right and and suddenly you know they come to this juncture in their life where they have a, a first disappointment a first time you know you are you are actually being wrong at something right and um, and and i think a lot of folks find it very tough to accept that right and uh, like i've seen this you know especially in the trading uh, world most successful traders i know are actually the ones who are very mediocre in their lives right in terms of you know because they're very they accept the mistakes really really fast and that's the key to succeed you know in trading and i think 
um and that's that's very uh, that's key to succeed i think you know while building businesses as well you know and, and not just to be what you're saying nitin is that the future of this industry is going to be people who are smart but humble enough to say that look you can't get it right all the time absolutely and find something going right really push it and make it happen as you absolutely. said make up every day for the next god knows how many years and just stay steadfast absolutely and then and then hope you are at the right place right time because you know unless <laughs> unless you know that goddess of luck smiles right and nothing else can happen i think i know i got this other theory as well which is the odds of getting lucky is more if more people want you to get lucky right so which means you know which means uh, the more good you do to people the you know you automatically improve the odds of getting lucky and uh, and especially in a b2c kind of business like us it's 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 very easy to do good and you know have that luck almost exponentially grow for you because you know i like like i said we have added 3 million customers without giving free account opening without giving some free bees or cash backs and without spending any 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 money on marketing or advertisement and i think that's come through because we truly believe that you know every customer we need to do what's right for him at every point of time you know and uh, and i think thinking like that helps you know in today's world where everyone's connected in on social media and all these things can go viral quite easily you know great so on that note of always do what is right for your customer thank you very much real pleasure chatting with you and i'm sure i'm going to go back and do more research on zero da as we go along <laughs> thanks thank you. thanks so if i ask you now how would you like to succeed as an entrepreneur you would have realized there are many ways to become a unicorn you could of course be the next zero da you could be a meena ganesh and make sure that you are able to make other entrepreneurs succeed and succeed herself or and as we heard from sharad you could aspire to be much beyond that and build trillion dollar stories for india all the best in all your efforts